Okay, uh, we get started, people will keep coming in and that's fine, we'll, we can deal with that. So we're talking here about uh, memory model beating high update rate data structures, um, which is a little bit of a uh, dark area in concurrency. So we'll be talking about the Issaquah challenge, uh, which was given to me by the gentleman in the corner over there uh, on uh, last February in Issaquah at the Standards Committee meeting. Uh, we'll talk about parallel updates, solve problem or not, uh, special cases for making it work better, and then one solution to the challenge. There's a previous solution that was published in May uh, as a C++ committee paper. I'm going to say N3047, but I'm not sure I got it right. But anyway, it's on the slide later on. First, I think we need to talk about the elephant in the room, or maybe more than one of them. I'm a C programmer. There's a little bit of the Linux kernel that's my baby. Um, and so if you really want huge amounts of template metaprogramming, you needed to be in this room an hour ago, okay? Um, I'm not gonna have much of that. I'm gonna relate a little bit to C++. If C kind of bothers you, think of it as pseudocode, all right? <laughs> <laughs> if these actually do, the things I'm gonna talk about do turn out to be useful, um, I'm sure there's plenty of people in the room that are well qualified to put the, rep, the normal template metaprogramming around them. Uh, I'm not one of those people. So uh, the other thing uh, we heard, uh, from uh, Chandler Kuroth, I mentioned this before, but there's some people who come in. Uh, he talked about the importance of performance programming with low level, and that's pretty much where this talk is aimed at, all right? You, this talk is talking about techniques where you need to get the last little bit out of the machine in unusual situations. It's typically cases where you're down to the low level of the stack, and the reason for that is if you're at the low level of the stack, you probably have a lot of users. If you have a lot of users, it's easier to justify doing, putting more work into making things faster. If you're up at the top of the stack, I, I worked my way through college on a system that had two users, okay? And so in that situation, you just kind of got it working, except the computers were horribly expensive back then. You paid per CPU second for them, but that's another story. It's a long time ago. Um, if you don't like that kind of thing, if you really want productivity, Michael Wong will be giving a talk on transactional memory on Friday, and I'd encourage you to go, go attend that. Um, Herb Sutter gave a really cool uh, two-hour talk earlier this week, and, he, and the subtitle was about razor blades. And so some of you may have a natural curiosity about my relationship to razor blades. You can look at my face and decide that I have somewhat less intense relationship with a razor than perhaps most in this room. Um, and uh, point of information, I grew my beard out starting in 1985 at the request of my then wife-to-be, um, so you can blame her. And I didn't really start heavy-duty parallel programming until the 90s. So that's one data point. Another data point is that back in the early 70s, this would have been almost 40 years ago, I used to work in a grocery store. I worked night shift, stocking the shelves. And part of the job was you got these cardboard boxes with cans in them and used razor blades to slice the top off the box so you put the cans on the shelf. Um, under that, with that kind of use, the razor blades wear out really fast. You'd go through several of them in, a, in an evening, most likely. Now, if we'd been, what, a more responsible mindset, we might have come up with some safe way of disposing of them. However, that wasn't really where we were at, um, and so what we did instead is we snapped them. And the guys are really good, I wasn't one of them, could uh, take these things and put it through an advertising sign. So you snap the razor blade and run through an advertising sign. I'm not gonna do that today. I don't have a razor blade with me. If I did and I tried this, I'd probably hurt somebody, probably myself, but I'll give a demonstration. Okay, you imagine that with a razor blade, and I used to do that. I don't anymore. I now know that I can die. I didn't back then. <laughs> anyway, um, we'll start off with what the Issaquah challenge is. It's an atomic multi-structure update. The idea is here, as you can see, we, want, we have a couple of binary search trees. And uh, normally with a binary search tree, you, you know, insert, you delete, you scan it, you know, look up an item. But what we're going to do here is we're going to move items from one tree to the other. All right? So we want to move element one from the left-hand tree to the right-hand tree. All right? We'd also like to move element four from the right-hand tree to the left-hand tree. And the key point here, I mean, you can do that easily enough, but it needs to be atomic. And what we mean by atomic is that if you look, so we're moving one from left to right. 
If you look at the left and you don't see one, if you then turn around and look to the right, you'd better see it. Similarly, if you look to the right and you see one, then if you look to the left, you better not see it. Okay? So it's atomic in that kind of a sense, kind of like file system operations are. A key other requirement is that if we're doing both of these move operations concurrently, there should be no contention. I mean, there's no overlap in the parts of the data structure being modified. I mean, for moving four, we only need to touch the four and its parent. Moving one, we only need to touch one and its parent. Those aren't the same structures, and so we should be able to do this concurrently without them knowing about each other even, without them paying attention to each other. And what that means is most locking solutions need not apply to solve this problem. We'll look at a little more detail on why that is. So I've been doing concurrency for over 20 years now. There, and, I, and there are people in the world who have been doing it a lot longer than I have. So a natural question is, yeah, hasn't somebody kind of already like done this before? And a lot of people have in a lot of ways. Let's take an example of a hash table. This is kind of a parallel programming workhorse. And it's a pretty straightforward thing. We've got an array of buckets. Each bucket might or might not have a linked list, open chaining, right? And uh, each bucket is protected by a lock. And what that means is we can operate on different buckets in parallel without any communication, any slowdown, or anything whatsoever. That works really wonderfully. Leads to perfect performance, stunning scalability, in theory. So let's suppose that we go and we do this thing. And, and let's do an easy thing right now. Let's forget about the updates. Let's just do a whole bunch of reads. So we're just doing a whole bunch of lookups on this hash table. Well. If we're using an ideal performance is that line up there. This is a log log plot. And there's a couple of read mostly techniques. RCU is the one that's uh, my favorite. Hazard pointers is Mag and Michael's favorite. He's a colleague in IBM research. But uh, per bucket locking, which is what we were talking about, that's not so good. I mean, you know, that's a big gap, and that's a log log scale. So that's well over an order of magnitude decrease. And global locking, of course, we knew it wasn't going to work, so that's no surprise. It's way down in the toilet down there, all right? But per bucket locking, I mean, we're supposed to be parallel and partitioned and all that, and it's not doing much for us. OK, well, I mean, one problem we could have had is maybe we didn't have enough buckets. So let's increase the buckets. We started with a 1,024. Let's double it, right? Well, uh, we do get an increase that, you know, we're having problems with there not being enough buckets. That's, that's one thing. but we still have this drop off beyond eight processors. And we can keep increasing. Once we get to 8192, increasing it more doesn't help much. There's not much air between 8192 and 16384. So we have a problem here. And again, we're just doing lookups. We have, and we have per bucket locks. Anyone want to guess what's happening here? Or maybe some people know. If you know, that's great too. Lawrence. We're swapping out threads. Uh, that is a good guess, um, but I'm an old line guy, so I didn't have any more threads and CPUs. But that, this, that would be a good way to get this to happen. We had um, 64 CPUs. We had at most 60 threads. Uh, we'll take the gentleman in the middle there. Some false sharing? False sharing. That'd be a good guess, too. That's an excellent way to have this kind of thing happen. But uh, I, was, I used alignment, and I was careful about that. We have the gentleman over on the side there. Uh, is it because of the cache updates between the different cores? You're close. You're close. Um, you're on the right track. Um, we'll get this guy here. I was going to say cache coherency. Cache coherency, kind of. OK. What about cache coherency? We'll get this guy over here. Very good. He got it right. NUMA, and we have off socket. This is an x86. It has 16 hardware threads per socket, eight cores per socket. But Intel numbers their CPUs in an interesting way. So they go through the first hardware thread in each core. That's our eight. And then the other ones are over here from 32 to 37 or whatever. Or 33 or 39, excuse me. Exactly. And we end up with something like this. I'm sorry I didn't actually put eight CPUs per core or put the threads. My art ability is limited, so this is what you get. The problem we have here is that uh, we've got these things in there, you know, maybe this big. That's about how big one of these CPU chips is. And uh, the speed of light is not infinite. In, uh, if we have a fairly slow, a two gigahertz processor, say, um, in one clock cycle, we get about this far and back, okay? About uh, 7.5 centimeters. The reason for over and back is that 
normally you have to say, I want that, and then it comes back to you. So you need, you need to go, you can't just send it normally. Okay, well, you know, the chip's only this big, and the speed of light area is this big, so what's the problem? Well, one problem is that, uh, you know, uh, integrated circuits aren't vacuums. Another problem is that we usually don't use light to communicate within an integrated circuit. I mean, there's people experimenting with that, but the production stuff uses electrons, not photons. And photons in conductors on the chip might get to 30% the speed of light. Inside of transistors, you'd be lucky for them to get 3%. And suddenly, you know, you're only going about this far in a clock cycle, and the chip's bigger than that, and, you know, something has to give. What it comes down to is we've got a couple of problems with fundamental statistics here. I mean, you know, this is, we got some fundamental problems here. Uh, maybe not insolvable, but they're hard. One, and uh, Stephen Hawking is, as far as I know, the first one to call both of these out, well, the speed of light is finite. And uh, with all the technology we have, and there was a false alarm a couple of years ago with neutrinos and some bad connector or something like that, but as far as we know, we can't make the data go any faster than the speed of light. Another problem we have is the atomic nature of matter. Uh, right now, the only way we know to do computations is use things like electrons and atoms and things like that and photons, and, and they're only so small. And that means light has to move a certain amount before anything can happen. Now, the theoretical limits on information are much, much smaller, as, uh, as Chandler pointed out a couple days ago, but we don't know how to get to those limits because we're still stuck working with electrons and atoms. Now, I don't know how to deal with those. Um, but the average age of this room looks quite young. This looks like a good challenge for you, and I suspect if you solve these two problems, there's a Nobel Prize waiting for you. So, you know, get started on that. But we can cheat. One way we can cheat is to use read mostly stuff, to read only. See, if we have a read only value, what's going to happen is it is going to kind of stay replicated in all these caches. So we'll have one here, same thing here, 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 and so on. And that means that this CPU instead of having to go off somewhere in the memory, just goes right there in its little cache and gets it. It's read-only, nobody's modifying it, so it stays very fast and everybody can get access to that data very, very quickly. And there's a bunch of techniques that are used to exploit it. All right. Um, hazard pointers is one of them, RCU is another, um, and there's a bunch of other ones that have been discussed um, in, this, in this conference so far. Unfortunately, as soon as this CPU does an update, bam! All the other copies get invalidated. That means that update's kind of expensive, although the hardware designers are really clever about this and they have all sorts of really sneaky tricks to overlap invalidation and the communication with getting other work done. But still, conceptually at some point, there has to be communication from here all across the chip and communication back saying, yeah, okay, fine, you can have it, I'm not using it. Otherwise, this guy can modify it, the guy up in the corner can modify it too. You can end up with two conflicting copies for the same data and that's not fun. I mean, I have written algorithms that work with that, but I'd rather not. Okay, well, doctor, it hurts when I do updates. What's the doctor say when you say that? Don't do updates. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't do updates. And uh, then you come back, well, you know, if I don't do updates, I run out of registers. And there are some algorithms, by the way, that will run in a register set. That we, you know, compared to back when I was very young, there's a lot of registered on machines now. And there are some fairly special purpose algorithms that you can do a huge amount just in the register set and not have to touch memory very, very fast. But uh, most of the stuff I work on does has a bigger data footprint than that. And so we have no choice at some point but to do updates. However, we clearly need to be very careful exactly how we do those updates because it makes a big difference. And I'm going to give a couple examples, some special cases. Uh, one of them I'm just going to do as a warm-up, and the second one is a key part we need to understand in order to make the Issaquah challenge work, the solution work. We're going to start with split counters. That's one of these things that as you get more and more CPUs on a system, things start biting you. If you get up somewhere, and, and what bites you depends on your workload to some extent, so this isn't hard and fast. But with the kind of workloads I've worked with, once you get to a few tens of CPUs, 30 or 40, um, your counters start really biting you. You do like an atomic increment on something, you keep count of like packets coming in the system or something like that. And you get up there and, and suddenly you're spending all your time waiting for that data value to come to you to increment it. Well, there's a well-known and really heavily used solution for that, for statistical counters. And that is, you split them. So each CPU or thread or what have you 
has its own counter. But in aggregate, these are conceptually one single counter. What that means is that uh, thread three increments just its own counter, and we can use uh, C, 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 C++ 11 or C11 memory order relaxed to avoid store tearing. Um, if you don't have that, you're gonna have to use volatile or trust to luck. Um, luck worked a lot better when the compiler was just stupid. Uh, it has worked less and less well as I've gotten further along in these things. The compiler's getting pretty aggressive about this kind of thing. So yeah, use something, all right? Uh, memory order relax is great for this, or a volatile cast isn't bad either, or just flagging the variables volatile. But you know, please don't just you know, increment it. Bad things can happen. Now, of course, uh, when you want to read the value out, any guesses what you do about that? You want to find out what the value of this aggregate counter is? Very good. A bunch of people got it. You sum them. Exactly. Now, uh, they're changing while you're doing this. So you're adding them up and they're changing. And that's actually OK for a lot of, a lot of situations. You're counting, the, say, the total amount of data that's coming to your system via networking. So you're adding up lengths of packets and they're coming in. Well, who knows what order the packets came in anyway exactly. Um, does it make sense to say exactly at this given time how, many, how big of data has come in? Because, well, there's some that's in memory. Uh, but you haven't incremented the counter yet, and there's some that's in the device, hasn't got to you yet, um, and there's some you have incremented, it's kind of hard to say exactly what the value should be. But as long as you get it within a little bit, right? As long as you get there within a few percent, that's good enough for the uses of that mechanism. It's basically we're monitoring how much data roughly have we received. Okay, give me a number. It's got to be monotonic and some other things like that over time, um, and that, that should work. And again, in this case, you use memory relax to avoid load tearing instead of store tearing, store tearing previously. So this is an example where updates don't need to slow us down if we maintain good locality. You see, if we look back at uh, this example, this guy is messing only with his own counter. And presumably we use alignment or something to avoid false sharing, as was called out earlier. You better do that, otherwise this is not gonna do what you want. And that counter is gonna remain in that guy's cache. The other counters remain in the other CPUs or threads caches. Now, when we sum them all up, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna get, you know, <coughs> cash misses every one of those you touch, except for your own. It's gonna be slow. The next guy, the other, next time the other guy tries to increment, he's gonna be slow. But for this sort of application, you're summing very rarely. You know, you might have an application every five seconds goes and grabs the data and sends it off to some monitoring application. Well, you're getting packets a million times a second. Once every five seconds is in the noise, you don't care. If you do care, well, use a different algorithm. Okay, so again, in the common case, you update only your own counter. Read should be rare. If they aren't rare, there's some other algorithms. There's, uh, I'll put these slides up somewhere, and you can, if you care, you can go take a look at that reference to see where they are. So that was the first thing. So we have one technique where we can do updates without getting hammered by the speed of light and the atomic nature of matter. Let's look at another one. And this is a little bit more involved. What we're going to do is we're going to not avoid all updates, but we're going to avoid unnecessary updates. So we have some big data structure, in this case a tree. We want to traverse it. We don't want to update the root node and the internal nodes. We only want to update the little nodes of the leaf that we're changing. So we want to avoid unnecessary updates, so we avoid unnecessarily hammering ourselves and others with cache misses. Okay, well the classic methodology, if you weren't doing this, um, would be that you would have a binary search tree, you lock the root, you select the descendant, you lock the descendant, unlock the previous node, and you keep doing that from step two. And that works, it's nice and uh, provably accurate. You'll get all sorts of nice properties and linearizability and everything else. But the lock intention on the root is not gonna be pretty. In fact, you almost might as well have a global lock. I mean, unless the operations you're doing on the leaves are really, really heavy weight, and so that you, you're only occasionally hitting the root, even though you're hitting it every time you do an operation, um, you may as well have a global lock. Okay, and besides, um, if we do this, if we do this method for a tree, one of the, remember one of the requirements we had was we had to have contention-free movement back and forth of independent elements between the trees. And this is not gonna be contention-free. We're gonna have contention on the root. So this, again, is not a method we can use to solve the challenge as stated. And that's why we have RCU. And it has, you could use hazard pointer for this as well, and there's some other techniques. I'm 
happen to be somebody who maintains this Linux kernel, so I'm going to talk about RCU. So the design principle here behind these methods is to avoid expensive operations and read-side code. So I'm going to take this to the extreme. Uh, when I was much younger, there was an old gray-haired guy that had a sign in his cube that said, only he who has gone too far can possibly tell you how far you can go. So let's go all the way, all right? <laughs> we got a couple of read-side primitives. You say RC read lock to say I'm starting to read. You say RC read unlock to say I'm stopping reading. Pound side define, RC read lock, new line. Or if you really hate the preprocessor, you can say um, static inline void, RC read lock, parent, parent, open curly brace, close curly brace. Maybe put a void in the parents too to make the compiler happy. And the unlock, same deal. Pound sign define, RC read lock, new line. Now, it's, it's kind of hard to make bold face assertions, but I'm going to assert that this gives the best possible performance, scalability, real time response weight freedom, and energy efficiency. <laughs> now again, you guys are young. Um, you know, you can handle the challenge. Um, you might be able to do better than this. Uh, if you do, it sounds really cool. I'd like to see it. It's going to require some negative overhead. So, you know, get started on that, too. Uh, that'd be a real good thing. One question you might have at this point, um, you know, if you say pound sign define RC read lock, parent, parent, I mean, that's not even making it to the compiler back end let alone to the machine. Now, there's no code being emitted for this. In fact, there isn't even any back-end work happening for it. Uh, that means it's not affecting the machine state. And so natural question is, how the heck are you doing synchronization with this? What, what's there to synchronize? Well, that's a, that's a reasonable question. The first thing, if you, if you saw Herb Sutter's talk, you saw something like this. Now, he used uh, much heavier weight atomics than I would use, but it's the same general principle. What we're going to do is we're going to add an element to a linked list. In this case, it's a very simple linked list, just a pointer with one element. And we're going to do that even though there's readers flying through this element at all times. So we're color coding this thing. Red means that uh, there are readers there. We can't stop them from being there. We can't delay them. We can't do anything. To, I mean, they say pound sign, read, you know, RC read lock doesn't do anything, and they go and read, right? So you, know, you can't do anything to them. And yellow, we don't have in this chart. We'll have a later chart. But in that case, is a special case where we have no new readers, but we might have some old readers that got there before something happened. And then green means it's safe for the updaters because readers can't see it, so the updater can do whatever it wants, whenever it wants, to that element. So what we're doing here is we're going through four states. Time is going from left to right. And in the initial state, we have a null pointer. And the readers read null, and nothing happens, and that's fine. We allocate some memory. So we end up with this, it's green because we're the only owner of it if the memory color is working right. If it's not working right, talk to Alistair. He has something to do with that, I think. Um, and we have a temporary pointer to it. We then initialize it. OK, let's initialize the field to something. And then if we are careful, we can then assign a pointer to that to the C pointer. And now the readers can see it. Now, um, careful means that we use something like RCU assign pointer, for example. Um, and this is a memory order release store, although it's not implemented that way in Linux kernel because we have to use compilers that don't do C11 yet. So we have to use the old stuff still. The readers have to be careful as well, and they use RCUD reference, which in the Linux kernel is a volatile casted load. You take the pointer, you cast it to volatile, you load through it, so you only pick it up once and only once. Um, but that's essentially a memory order consume. That's, that use case is what memory order consume was intended for. And the thing is that the readers coming through are either going to see this null pointer or they're going to see this element correctly initialized. But either way, they're going to see something valid. All right? Just again, like Herb's example a couple days ago. And it turns out that that's sufficient for a number of techniques, a number of situations. Um, obviously, what can happen is somebody can get the pointer and it's null. They get preempted or interrupted or something or delayed. Somebody else picks up the pointer. It's not null. They go immediately, so you have this apparent misordering. But in a lot of applications, that's all right. Uh, one application where that is all right is uh, network routing. It took many tens of seconds or maybe minutes for the routing update from the failure to get to you. During that many tens of seconds or minutes, you've been sending the packets the wrong way. So you send them the wrong way for another few microseconds. Who cares? And uh, now, for some applications, this is a problem. And one of the things we'll talk about later is some ways to restore 
the determinism or restore the ordering after the fact. Okay, so the readers in this case don't need to be guarded against. So for this case, we could have the readers do nothing and then read and then do nothing again to say they're not reading. So we've shown how we can add elements to a data structure, add elements to a linked data structure with empty read side primitives. But of course, if all we're doing is adding, um, we have this thing called a memory leak. And that's not really a good thing if you want your software to run continuously for a long period of time. So we really need to be able to remove things and recycle the memory as well. So that's what this slide does. All right, so we start off, this time I use a real linked list just for variety. We've got a linked list with a BOA, a CAD, and a GNU. Um, and uh, we need to remove this from the list. And if you think about it, this is just a, there's a pointer next to the BOA pointing to the CAT. If we take a pointer to the GNU and just store it carefully, uh, using a memory order release atomic store, for example, into the next pointer of the BOA, we'll have this situation. Now, readers might still be referencing the cat. We don't know. They aren't leaving any trace of memory to tell us whether or not they're there. Might be there, might not. At this point, however, we have that yellow color. The only ones that are there are the ones that showed up before we did this deletion. New readers can't get there. They go straight from the BOA to the GNU. They can't find the cat. And that turns out to be important. If we wait for all the readers, and in the Linux kernel synchronized RCU is a primitive that does that, we wait for all the pre-existing readers to get done. Don't worry about the readers that started afterwards, but all the readers are there at the start of this operation. Wait till they're done. Well, new readers can't get there. We've waited for all the old readers to get done. So now we have the cat being green. We're the, we have the only reference to it. And nobody can get a new reference to it. And then once that happens, we're free to free the element and uh, reuse it for whatever, and life is good. But of course, uh, one question is how the heck, you know, it's nice to have synchronized RCU, but if the readers aren't leaving any trace of memory, how the heck do you implement it, right? Anybody have any ideas? Yeah, okay. How, how about people that haven't seen Linux kernel code? <laughs> well, go ahead. Uh, we'll let you, you had your hand up first, we'll let you go ahead. Yep. So reader cannot be granted. So if you schedule that CPU, it means it means that the reader has finished. Exactly. So you got it exactly right. CPU, and uh, here's an illustration of that. So again, uh, repeating, uh, this is for non-preemptive environments. There are implementations of RSU for preemptive environments. They're more complicated. They're, uh, but you know, let's let's take the simple one in this case. I got to talk about other stuff. So let's do the simplest thing first. RC readers are not permitted to block. This is the same rule you have to impose for spin locks in a non-preemptive environment. If you don't impose that rule for spin locks, you will get self-deadlock. So since we have to do it for spin locks, let's do it for the RC readers as well. If you do RC read lock, well, it doesn't generate any code, but it imposes a rule on you, you have to not block until you get to the corresponding RC read unlock. Now, if you do that, what that means, well, we do synchronize RCU. So we, re, we come along here, we got CPU 0, 1, and 2, where time is going from left to right again. These blue arrows are RC read side critical sections. So there's an RC read lock here and an RC read unlock here. There might be RC read references inside of here. Uh, we remove the cat, like we saw in the previous diagram. We do a synchronized RCU. That waits for all the readers, so it immediately blocks. We now have a context switch. Now, the fact we have a context switch means that we've locked. And if the read side critical sections are following the rules, that means we cannot be in a read side critical section because we're not allowed to block in read side critical sections. Now, the only read side critical sections that can reference the cats are the ones that were there to begin with, these two. So as soon as they get done, we can't possibly have any references to the cat anymore. Well, we're using context switch as a proxy for this. So in this case, once we see this CPU do a context switch, we know that this read side critical section has to be done because it's not allowed to context switch. If it's following the rules, this context switch means all the previous read side critical sections have completed. Similarly, on CPU 1, now we have a couple of, we waited longer than we had to, right? These two guys couldn't possibly have accessed the cat. They came too late. But okay, so we waited a little, long, a little longer. That's not necessarily a problem. 
Then this guy context switched. At that point, all the CPUs have context switched. That means all read side critical sections in the kernel, in the system, that could possibly have seen the cat have now finished. Any read side critical sections happening along the way can't see the cat anymore. Therefore, it's now safe to free up the memory backing the cat. So the key point is that read lock and read unlock don't need to change the machine state. They act not on the machine, but on the developer who has to follow the rules. If he does an RC read lock, he is under the constraint that he is not supposed to do anything that blocks. And he's not supposed to until such a time as he gets the matching RC read unlock. And that means that this is synchronization via social engineering. Now, that's also true for every other synchronization mechanism I know about. So for example, we've all heard of void data races. Hans Bohm might have written a paper or two about that over the last several years. And if you're going to use C++ Atomics, if you don't avoid data races, you get undefined behavior. Okay, so part of the C++ Atomics mechanism is a social engineering component that constrains the, compi the compiler too, but the developer not to write certain types of code. With locking, you have things about you access shared variables only when holding the corresponding lock. The lock does something, but the social engineering is necessary too, otherwise the lock who knows what it'll do, it won't help you. And similarly with transactions, you have a rule about, okay, if you're gonna have transactions work for you, you have to access the shared variables within the context of a transaction. The unusual thing about RCU in this case is it's pure social engineering, yes? Uh, you mentioned compilers. What actually prevents the compiler from reordering some context switches into your critical section, mm -hmm. since RCUs are not even visible to the compiler either? Mm -hmm. So that's a good question. What prevents the compiler from reordering context switches into the um, critical section since they're not visible to the compiler. There's a, um, what happens in the Linux kernel, um, if you have that possibility, um, you have, what happens in Linux kernel is we have to make this work in preemptible and non-preemptible environments. Therefore, uh, if you actually looked at the, at the code, it would say preempt disable, which doesn't do anything in, uh, a, in a non-preemptible environment and also, and then RC read unlock would do preempt enable except that it contains something called barrier parent parent, which maps to a GCC ASM that says, don't do anything, but don't, mess, don't make memory go back and forth. So you could argue that I misspoke a few slides ago when I said the back end doesn't see it. Well, it sees that it's not supposed to move stuff back and forth across it. Okay. So good point. Okay, um, now go ahead. Um, that's a good question. The question was, hey, it uh, works in the kernel, but in user space, I can preempt at any time, so how can this work? Uh, we actually do have a user space RCU library. It has a couple different implementations of RCU. The kernel has several, too. One of them has this property where the read side doesn't do anything, essentially. And uh, what happens is that it, it can't see the preemptions, as you say. What happens instead is there's another primitive you call saying, hey, um, pretend I'm now in a quiescent state, if you will. Um, so it's essentially uh, it's equivalent inside the Linux kernel you might call schedule parent parent saying, hey, okay, I'm done. Okay. You have to, and what exactly that means with respect to your application is your choice. If you had a transaction processing system, maybe you do that at the end of every transaction or some other place where you know you, you can't be messing with any RCU protected data. So yeah, it's a good question and uh, we just have to do things differently in different environments but we can get the job done. Um, and uh, also, if you have to have a, a, a situation where you don't have those kind of points, you don't know about them, then there are implementations that do a very small amount of local work on the RC read lock and the RC read unlock. So you have some actual mechanism to go along with the social engineering. But they're more complicated, so we'll leave them aside. <clears throat> and uh, the gentleman in the white in the middle there says something about scheduling each CPU. And here is a toy RC implementation, fully functional although I wouldn't try it in a production environment. 20 lines of code with full read side performance. And some people still insist this is complicated. I guess there's no accounting for taste. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the readers do. Uh, and this is just kind of a pattern you follow. You do RC read lock. You pick up a pointer using RC do reference, which in C++11 or C11 would turn into a memory order consume load. 
um, which could be promoted to acquire if you want. That's what the compilers currently do. At that point, you know that, that the thing P points to is guaranteed to stay existing, stay around in memory. You can do something with it until you do the RC read unlock. And as soon as you do that RC read unlock, it might be freed off from under you. Okay, so you pick something up in an RC read to that critical section, do stuff with it in the confines of that critical section. If you need it to go outside, you need to either, you need to get some other synchronization mechanism to protect it in the transition. So for example, you might be under RCU and then say, oh, I need this for a long time, I'm gonna get a reference to it, an explicit reference count. Or you might acquire a lock that's part of it, or a number of other things. But the normal use, you just stay within the confines of the read site critical section. Updaters have a little more work to do. Uh, and this is used for cases where you're mostly reading, so this is a good trade-off. If you're using this where you're mostly updating, well, there's some cases where you do that too, but they're more rare. So you have, updaters have to have some mechanism for synchronizing among themselves. RCU doesn't care what it is. RCU's responsibility is between the updaters and the readers. Between the updaters, you have to do something else. In the Linux kernel, it's mostly spin locks. Although, you could use anything, transactions or atomic operations or what, I don't know, anything. So what happens is you get the old value of the pointer, you do an RCU assigned pointer, which would be a memory order release store, into the, and you take a new pointer and store it there. Now you've got a copy of the old pointer in queue, the readers see the new pointer. You release the lock normally, sometimes you have to hold it across synchronized RCU, most of the time you do it before. You do a synchronized RCU to wait for all the readers to get done. Once that happens, the people that have seen this value through CPTR have to finish, they have to let go of it, and you're free at that point to free it. So that's kind of the patterns for the readers and the updaters. Okay, so we've got kind of the background. I apologize for going so quickly through that. I do have a two hour presentation that just covers the last seven slides we've done, but you know, uh, we got to do other things besides that. And there's a bunch of uh, URLs and other things at the end if you want to go look more deeply. All right, so we had this methodology before where we did hand over hand locking down the tree. And given the tools we have now with RCU, we can do something a lot better. We can say RC read lock, and we can traverse starting at the root. We don't lock. We get an RC read to our critical section, so that root has to stay around until we come out. We don't come out until the end. We use key compares to select the descendants. We repeat until we reach the update location. Then we acquire locks on the update location, okay? Because we need to update that, so we we have to do something. So we acquire locks there. That update location is guaranteed to stick around because we're in an RC read to our critical section. And at that point, we have to do consistency checks because who knows what might have changed while we were acquiring the locks. And we'll look at those a little bit later. And then we carry out the update, and then life is good. This completely eliminates contention on the root node. We're only reading it. No updates, no stores whatsoever to it, no invalidations, no atomic operations. Yes? That's an excellent observation. Give me a few slides and, we'll, we'll, and ask that question again or I'll, uh, if I don't address it. But that's exactly right, we're still locking. But, there's a but there. Okay. So, uh, the thing is though that some, the thing is, if, let's say we're going down and we wanna add an element to the bottom of the tree. Well, this thing we're gonna add it to, it's guaranteed not to be freed, but if somebody removes it from the tree, we stick ours on the end of it, and then they free this element, we got this thing dangling out and space isn't connected and that doesn't help anybody. So we need to have some kind of a remove flag to avoid that problem. And the way that ends up happening would be more like the following. We have a loop, we do the RC reset critical section inside the loop now. We again start with the loop without, start with the root without locking, we do comparisons, we get till we get the thing, we acquire update location locks. And if that location has a remove flag set, we know that, okay, yeah, it's still there. The memory's still there. It's gonna stay there till we get out of the read side critical section. But, you know, as soon as we leave there, somebody's gonna free it. So at that point we say, okay, fine. We're not gonna to attach to this thing because it's, it's doomed. It's a zombie element. So, we, so in that case, we come back or we release all the locks and we come back around and try again. On the other hand, if the remove flag is not set, then we break out of the for loop and carry out the update, okay? So that allows us to interact with the deletions. Yes? So the for loop trigger No, the, uh, uh, yeah, I should have put braces on that, I'm sorry. So the for loop starts there and it ends right here. So the, we enter and leave the RCU critical section on each iteration of the loop. Um, and 
unless, of course, we break out, in which case we take care of it here. Okay, so that could allow us a way of dealing with this. And the idea here is that we're focusing the contention on the part of the structure being updated. We still have the potential of contention. We are acquiring locks. But we put it off at the leaves of the tree, which are spread out, as opposed to the root, where everybody has to go through. And of course, full partitioning works better when you can do it. But you know, sometimes you need a tree. Um, this has been around for some time. Um, I know that it's worried about down to here, which is 10 years ago. And these two guys, given what they did in their paper, I'm pretty sure they had to think about this, although it's not obvious to me in the paper. So this might go back 34 years. So this isn't exactly, that concept's not exactly the new stuff. So that lets, gets us to where we can have one solution. So here's our tree, our two trees, actually. Remember, we have our left tree and our right tree. And we're trying to move things back and forth between the trees. And we're protecting different parts of the tree with different mechanisms. The upper part is using RCU. On the bottom, we have to use locking to protect the things we're actually changing. So if we want to delete this element, we need to lock this and this element right here, these two. And that gives us what we need to change the pointer here and to get rid of this guy. And if we're adding, we need a lock on the thing we're adding too. And of course, we need to do consistency checks, which we'll get to in a bit. So essentially, we have different regions of applicability for the different synchronization methods. We're going to use the two locking and RCU together in order to allow us to have the synchronization we need to the bottom to actually carry out the update, and also to but avoiding the contention in the top, where we really don't care what happens. OK, well, bad things could happen because you acquire the locks. You don't have any locks, and somebody could change anything, right? Well, I mean, one thing is this is how it looked when you tried to get the locks. That's why you went there. You want to do something to this element that has a parent. Um, and uh, maybe they both got deleted. Could happen. They both have the removed flag set. Maybe the parent got deleted, but the other one didn't. That might happen with the tree getting restructured in some way. It could be that the thing you want got deleted, the parent's still there. Or it could be something got inserted between the two. All right? And you detect that because there's no longer a pointer from the parent to the child. In any of these cases, you, you can detect these pretty easily with tests after you acquire the locks. In all these cases, you drop the locks and retry. Because something happened while you were getting the locks, you need to restart to find the element or find it's not there or whatever it is. OK, so now we've got the place where update. But it's not enough just to update, all right? We need to update atomically with multiple changes happening at the same time and make them look simultaneously to everybody that's looking. For that, we have something called existence structures. We're doing the standard thing here. We're solving a computer science problem by inserting a level of indirection. Oldest tradition, right? And here's kind of what we're doing. So we have a data structure, and this might be, remember we're moving element one and element four back and forth. The top one might be element uh, one on the, on the left-hand tree, and this might be element one that we're inserting into the new tree, all right? So these each have a, a pointer added to their data structures, and that pointer points to an existence structure. This thing has a pointer that points to the switch location. It also has an offset. And then the switch points one of two places. Right now, it's pointing to the thing on top. But later, we're going to make a point down there. So let's see what happens. Well, we go and we get this existence pointer. We follow it. We say, hey, the offset's zero. Remember that. We go over here. We go where it points. And we say, OK, offset zero in that array, one. It's a one. Great, we exist. If down here, however, we go through there, same thing, existence pointer. Offset's one, though, not zero. Come up here. We point up there. Offset one is zero. Hey, I don't exist. So we go through. Remember we had that deleted, that removed flag? A flag, and we found that. We sort of pretended we didn't see it because it wasn't really there anymore. This has the same general feel to it, except we're doing a little bit more work to figure out whether or not this element exists at this particular time. The cool thing about this is we can do a single store, single non-atomic store to that element, and at the same time make the guy on top disappear and the guy on the bottom reappear. So currently, this thing references that array on top. If we do a store and make it point to the thing on bottom, now let's follow through and see what happened. The guy on the top that used to exist, he's still got an existence. He's got an offset of 0. That doesn't change. The pointer points down here, 0. He doesn't exist. He used to exist. Now he doesn't. 
The guy on the bottom, who used to not exist, his offset's one, go through here to here, offset one, he now exists. And because we did a store to one location, if you go through and see the one, see the change, you have to see it again when you go the other way. Now that does require memory barriers in some cases, but um, in other words, you want to do a store release, and the guy's gonna have to do a load, load acquire out of the existence thing. If, um, and there's a special case where you can use relax instead, we'll get there in a few slides. Go ahead. Why not a bit set where the offset is an index into the bit set? In other words, let me, let me, let me repeat back what I thought you said. So what we could have is we'd have a, an array of bits. Yeah. Oh, so we could have, we'd have this be a number. Okay, and uh, this could just be four bits instead of four bytes or four whatever it is. And then we go here, so if I, let me go through this and see if I understand what you're saying. So we go through here for doing it, uh, doing it Gore's way. We have an existence structure. We have this thing. We pick up a pointer. It says offset one. We pick up this thing, and it's, right now it says uh, offset two. And so we say, all right, add offset two to one. That's three. Zero, one, two, three, this bit. And that bit's set, so same as before. That's not what you meant. No, I was asking why existence, which is not a number, but it takes one or two. And oh, okay, and then index into array. So let me, let me try again and see if I get it this time. So we got an array still, um, but it's an array with four elements stored together as opposed to split two. No, no, no. No, the existence switch is just a bit, a bit, bit set. A bit set. It's not a pointer. Yeah, and then, you could, and then you could look at that bit and say do this or that. Yes. You could. Um, that would be another way of doing it. Um, the code I have actually stores a pointer um, because instead of testing a bit, I just pick the pointer and direct through it. Um, which one's fast or not probably depends on your hardware and your compiler and everything else. But yeah, as long as you make it so that you can do a single store and change the decision and have everybody see the change, it'll work. Yes? You're limited to your number of, I, and you may be limited for other reasons, but you're limited to the number of data structures if you have a you know, 32, 64 bit, bit set versus your table can be as big as you want. Well, um, <laughs> So he, he said there are some limits if we, if we had a bit versus the other. Um, one thing we can do, I mean, we just got this single element B pointing this. We could have a whole pile of different data structures having a pointer here, so that's not a limit. Um, in principle, we could have offsets be bigger and have more things, and we could also have more arrays and more places the existence switch did. Um, and I think a pointer allows you to organize that more easily, but, you know, again, if you're specifically worried about only this case, perhaps their thing would be an optimization to run faster. I don't know. As usual, there's a number of ways of attacking the problem. Okay, so you can go backwards too. I mean, you can switch this thing back and forth uh, with single stores and make these things appear and disappear. Um, and uh, this is, I apologize, is C code, not C++. Again, think of it as pseudocode if it uh, bothers you. Um, I put them in one array, uh, 1001. And then each of those, in that second column, there are existence structures, and they are constant, star, star, existence switch, and our offset's there. And I took and put them all into one structure rather than having multiple structures to manage, a little bit easier that way. So we've got the outgoing existence group, which is the upper element from that previous thing, and then the incoming one, which is the bottom one. The existence switch was that yellow box in the middle. And uh, then the existence switch points to either the first or the, or, excuse me, the zeroth or the second element of that array. All right, you just update it either way. And this is used by RCU to mediate um, freeze because we don't necessarily want to take the overhead or the latency, excuse me, of a synchronized RCU. This allows us to kind of do a fire and forget thing where you say, hey, um, when the grace period is expired, when all the readers are done, invoke this function on this data element. And that function is often something like free or wrapper around it. And that way you can just say, go, go send that thing off and go do your next thing without taking a delay because who cares when you free the memory exactly anyway. Okay, so um, this is our thing again, and I'm gonna abbreviate it like this in the diagram because I am not a good enough artist to draw all that uh, several times on a hang with each of them hanging off a tree, so I'll draw this thing on the bottom. And so we have red and blue, these, it's something pointing here won't exist, something pointing here will exist, and we can switch the colors. And that's a shorthand for this other stuff we saw. One objection is, you know, I said I was going to add a level of indirection. 
I had it three levels of indirection. That'll be fast, won't it? <laughs> the thing is, though, that most of the time, the elements exist and they're not being moved. And so we do a special case. We optimize for that by having a null pointer instead of a pointer to an existence structure. So what you do when you go in there is you say, all right, is this thing null? If it is, this thing exists and don't worry about anything else. Same cache line and a fast check. If it's not null, then we go through this chase the pointer, get the offset, and do thing rigor roll we had on the previous slides. Um, please note this is backwards of the normal use of the null pointer. Normally, if something's null, it means it doesn't exist. And uh, if it's not null, it does exist. We're doing it backwards here. If it's null, it does exist. And if it's not null, well, it might or might not. You've got to go check down the data structure to find out. OK, well, I mean, if you really, really bother you, you can use some non -null, special non-null value in that case if you want. It's up to you. But in the uncommon case, we traverse the structure, as shown on the previous slides, and that's expensive, multiple cache misses probably, but this is presumably an uncommon case, so that should be all right. And there's no free lunch. With this optimization, I mentioned before we had the, had the uh, loads and stores having to have memory, consume, memory release and memory acquire. This is why, because we have this null pointer optimization. If the existing structure was always there, and you always took the overhead there, then you could use a relaxed load when you access the existence switch. So, you know, I suspect this optimization is better than the, than the relaxed load, but, uh, you know, your mileage may vary. So, go ahead. Um, on your diagrams, you use the data structure A and data structure B. Did you actually mean, like, node A and node B? These pointers are on each individual node, right? They are. And, um, yeah, you could argue that I should have said left-hand tree or something, or node three of left-hand tree or something like that. Um, so it's not one pointer for, it's just, there's a pointer embedded in every single node data structure. There's a pointer embedded in every single node data structure, including the leaves. That's absolutely right. Think of, think of A as, uh, well, well, we'll take a look at uh, an example here that hopefully will help with that. So yes, we got one of the, we got, in this case, we got null pointers in all of these things. There's what, uh, 12 different nodes up there. Each of them has a null pointer in it, all right? Um, if they're being moved, they have a pointer to one of these existence structures. Right now, they're not being moved, they're just sitting there. What we want to do is we want to move four, we're doing two concurrent operations doing moves. We're atomically moving one from the left hand tree to the right hand tree. We're atomically moving four from the right hand tree to the left hand tree. All right? In fact, just for grins and because it was simpler to draw the diagram, we're going to make the pair of moves atomic, one atomic operation for the pair of moves. All right? So we start by allocating an existence structure and a couple of nodes, all right? So um, if, some, if somebody came through here beforehand, let's just go back one slide again. And they looked up uh, element four, they'd say, yep, 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 uh, element four, null pointer, it exists. Great. We're good. When we do this change here, it's a little more complicated. They'll come down here, they'll say, ooh, element four, it's got a null, null pointer. Go through the existence pointer, oh, great, it's a one, it does exist, okay. So we have a difference in computation but the same result when we make this change of adding this existence pointer, existence structure in. The, uh, this four we're gonna stick into the left-hand tree, the one we're gonna stick in the right-hand tree, but they aren't there yet, so no, they don't make any difference yet. Yes? Is there a need to update the existence structure in four and one as an atomic operation? Like, can, okay. you have to do one at a time, right? You do, but let's look at what happens. So let's say that, uh, that uh, we right now have four stuck together and one isn't, all right? So we're gonna pretend that this arrow right here isn't there yet. Well, if we go down four, we say, okay, ooh, we gotta do some more work, but oh, it exists. So nothing has changed. We go over here, we see a null pointer, therefore it exists. As soon as we store this thing, oh, we gotta do more work, but it still exists. So because of that, we don't need the atomicity when we're wiring this thing up, which it's is- the second step. The second step is what kills us, yes, or something anyway. And, uh, but first, we have to wire up one and four, the new ones. And they're light colored because they don't exist yet. Another, just to emphasize the point. We do that. Well, beforehand, if we looked for one in the right-hand tree, we'd have gone this one, this one, oh, null pointer, there's nothing there. Now there's more work. We go, oh, there's this thing and it's one. Go through its existence pointer, it's got one. Oh, it doesn't exist. So we did more work, but we got the same answer. So it doesn't matter exactly when we wire that into the structure because it isn't changing the overall computation. It's just making it more complicated. <clears throat> All right. So now the fun part, we hit the switch. 
So we do one store into that, remember that yellow box that uh, either pointed or had a bitmap or any number of ways we talked about making it happen, and bang. All of a sudden, one doesn't exist on the left-hand side, four does. One does exist now on the right-hand side, and four doesn't in one atomic thing. Yes, way in the back. So you're, you're, allowed, to, you're allowing yourself to make a copy. I, I'm sorry, I must have misunderstood the original. Yes. You're making a copy of those one and four and putting that in the other three? We are, but... We're not actually moving the, the, the physical memory. We're, if, we want, if, we, if we don't want a copy, we're going to have to have a pointer to something. That both of the both of the new and the old thing point to. So that's an excellent point. Um, uh, there's a way around it. And yes, so I added four levels of interaction. <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of uh, container structures that have that level of interaction already. So you know, um, in those cases, we aren't even causing more pain than we already cause. Is that damning faint praise or what? You know. <laughs> okay. So. Now we've done the switch, and uh, at this point, the guy is doing the lookup on this side of the tree, suddenly see four not being there. And because they don't see it being there, we're safe to remove it, because if we get rid of this pointer to four and that pointer to the light colored one way over there, we haven't changed the answer. We've just changed the method of computing it. So we disconnect them. At this point, there may be readers that are still ratting around with node 4 and node 1 in this existence structure. Remember, RC readers, we have no control over them. There's nothing, no way we can stop them. We can't even slow them down, really. Uh, we can make them have cache misses by writing on their pointers or traveling, but that doesn't really help. So we have to wait for them to get done. So we wait a grace period. Then we can free up the existence pointer of the old nodes. And the cool thing about this, and this gets back, I think, to the question you asked earlier. The cool thing about this is we don't have a lock at the top, we've got them on the nodes. And that means if your workload maintains a locality reference, if a given thread tends to hit only elements one and two over here, then the synchronization primitives maintain a locality reference as well. You'll keep this node in your cache, you'll keep its lock in your cache. In contrast, if you had a hashed array of locks, for example, you'd have no locality reference because the hash function is smearing all the different threads' locks together, you're sharing locks and getting unnecessary contention and also getting cache thrashing. So, um, you know, that's, that's one to think about. Um, I'm going to quickly go through some stuff. I'm willing to stay here longer, but if people need to go, um, go ahead and leave. That's, that's okay. Uh, you know, uh, you only signed up to be here an hour, so if you want to be done after an hour, you can do that. All right. So what do we do? We have an existence point in each element. Null says it exists. Non-null says go look over here to see whether it exists or not. And uh, we can make the existence of multiple uh, elements switch automatically and, and atomically as well. And this is wonderful, but I'm telling you, you need a good API to get this right, especially that bit about null being it exists. I mean, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'd mess that up every time if I didn't have it buried behind something else. And so I'm not going to go in detail through this, but this is kind of the elements on the existence structure. You allocate them, free them. You uh, get the one out of that's the outgoing one. You get the one that's the incoming one and uh, set, set the thing, clear it, and and change it and so on. <coughs> and for the tree, we have wrappers around those and some additional things. So we have an atomic move that we'll talk about. We, we went through what that did with the diagrams. Um, we uh, add uh, the existence. So we add a, add a node with specified existence. Normally, you add it. It's just a null pointer, and there's no exist it exists un unconditionally. I remove this thing, even though it doesn't exist right now. I, you know, the one that has this existence pointer, remove it. Never mind the fact it doesn't exist officially. I want to get rid of it, really. OK, so that's what the third one does. And uh, uh, excuse me, I got that backwards. Existence remove is going to remove the existence pointer from it. And then the delete existence at the bottom is deleting the thing that has a existence says it doesn't exist. Normally, if you tried deleting it, it would wait for the existence to go away. Um, but you want to be able to really delete it. And the cool thing about this, we can't actually reuse exactly the same object code. We also don't ex reuse exactly the same source code. But we make minimal modifications to an existing tree algorithm. You just take a normal tree search, insert, delete sort of thing. You put these additional checks for existence in there, and you're good to go. Yes? Would that work for balanced trees? Because then you might have to do rotations and. Would that work for balanced trees? Yeah, that's another elephant in the room I didn't talk about, isn't it? 
In fact, balanced trees and concurrency is a big elephant that there's, there's a lot of people hammering their PhD dissertations on because, you know, you got to keep the balance of information and information, and that stuff just kind of propagates all the way to the root every time you tear touch anything, and guess what? You just lock the root again, or even if you use atomics, you're atomically modifying the root. You know, it's, it's horrible. Um, my approach here is I'm going to batch balance it. Actually, the thing I do is I, uh, is I just populate the tree ahead of time and get it balanced. Um, and uh, I elect not to remove internal nodes which means that it'll stay balanced after that, which is cheating, by the way. Um, but um, I actually, this is one of the reasons why I'm not certain that binary search trees are the right answer for, for uh, concurrent programming. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of smart people trying to think, see how to balance these things concurrently. I can imagine a batch rebalance where you just go through and rebuild the whole tree while people are accessing the old copy. That might work. Um, you know, but, but, um, there's, a, there, there's some uh, interesting problems to be solved in that area, and I chose not to for this thing. On the other hand, I could do the same thing for any other data structure, right? I could make this work in a hash table. I could make it work in a linked list. Any linked structure, this will work. So I was, the problem I was given was a binary search tree. They said that's what it had to be, so that's what I did. But, but I'm, not, uh, I'm not necessarily limited by the, uh, what shall we say, uh, uh, equivocal practical applicability of binary search trees and concurrent algorithms. That wasn't what I wanted to do. That was what I wanted to do. I'm not going to go through this in detail. This is just pseudocode that goes through the same steps. We went through those set of diagrams last time. It just shows you know, allocating and setting things up, moving them and, and removing it. And it ties it back to the uh, primitives, the API members defined on the previous couple slides. So this is there. I'll, I'll put these up. And if you're perusing them later, you can see that thing. And this just illustrates some of the things we're using the C++ memory model. The main thing we have here that wasn't really there is when we do that existence update, we have to kind of do a memory order release store followed by a atomic thread fence, uh, which I think needs to be an acquirer fence, but might need to be ACRL uh, because we need to avoid that moving in either direction. Uh, but the primitives are there, it's a little bit strange. And uh, memory order consumed to versus tree porters, except that uh, no C11 or C11 compiler I know of implements this efficiently. And so I use the Linux kernel version of RCD reference, which does a volatile cast um, in order to keep the compiler from playing too many games with the pointer that it's loading. OK, performance and scalability. Now, this is the worst case. This is where, where all you're doing is moving stuff back and forth between the trees. Now, I've done range partitioning so that one task is messing with one key, another task with another set of keys. And so there shouldn't be any contention. Um, this line down here is what I got with uh, N4037. And that uh, is actually pretty embarrassing. We've got eight CPUs. We only get 3.7x throughput. Uh, the 6.4x, which I've gotten now, is kind of semi-competent, maybe OK, sort of. Um, but it's certainly better than last May. Um, and I'll talk about some of the things I ran into and what I'm doing about them a little later. Unfortunately, if we expand that out full on the X scale, instead of just looking at the first eight CPUs right here, we expanded out to 60. Um, life is quite a bit worse. Uh, we only get 12.7x out of 60 CPUs, which uh, isn't what I'm here for. Um, you know, there's some people who might celebrate that result, not me. Sorry. Uh, the issues I'm facing right now is some fun with allocators and the uh, user space RCU implementation. Both of them are fixable. User space RCU was designed. Uh, I contributed to it. Uh, designed for read mostly situations. Right now, we're just taking and dumping updates through it, like that. I mean, every time you do anything. You're taking and allocating and freeing things. Um, and uh, the Linux kernel RCU has a bunch of code to deal with that sort of thing, which is a good thing because it's not hard to get hundreds of thousands of, of call RCUs happening in a very short time. And if there's suddenly a whole bunch of them, it takes evasive action and does so fairly quickly. User space RCU isn't quite that sophisticated yet, although more recent versions are better than the uh, version that was, say, in, uh, in Ubuntu 12.04. Um, but we have some work to do there. Um, I didn't do it for this one because this is work that takes days or weeks, not, not minutes or hours. And so I decided that I would be best to present a poor result as opposed to, huh, you know, it's broken and I can't run it right now. So here we are. So not something I'm really proud of, but, you know, at least it's, uh, at least it's scaling to some extent. If we use the mixed workload, and I took this, uh, there's a paper by Grimali, Grimoli et al. in uh, uh, CACM uh, earlier this year. Uh, democratizing transactional memory, I think is the title of it. And they said, oh, we're going to do a tree and we're going to have 90% lookups and 10% other things. 
and they had full scans as far as the other things. They didn't say exactly what they had, so I picked 3% insertions, 3% deletions, 3% full tree scans, 1% moves. You notice the numbers are a lot smaller. That's because we have 4,096 elements in the tree, and that means we got 2,048 internal nodes, and we're scanning. We visit each of those internal nodes twice, and so it takes one good long time to scan. And so that 3% uh, is way more than 3% of the execution time. But, you know, we're doing kind of okay, 39.9x on 60 CPUs, almost two-thirds of the scaling. It's all right. Um, and we're having, because we have some updates, we're having some of the problems we talked about on the previous slide. Okay, and of course, being who I am, I got to show you lookups. And uh, here on 60 CPUs, we get 80.5x, and now, now we're talking, okay? Um, and uh, there may, yeah, uh, there's some people with funny looks on their faces. Uh, why, don't you, why don't you vocalize the question? Get it out there. <laughs> <laughs> so how the, we only got 80, we only got 60 CPUs. How that to be an 80 percent, 80x throughput? Well, um, you can't have super linear speed up. What happens is I got 4,096 nodes. If I have one CPU, that CPU deals with all the nodes. If I have 60 CPUs, it deals with you know 60 some out of the nodes. Therefore, it has a lot less stress on its cache. Fewer cache misses, it goes faster. This is not that extreme. Um, a couple of years ago, I presented at uh, Hotpar. Uh, May solving algorithm that on two CPUs got 4x speed up. So, you know, it can be a lot more aggressive than this. But good, you know, glad you guys are paying attention, though. Anyway, my hope is to get something like this for the other ones. I don't know if I'll get super linear speed ups, but I should be able to get something a little less embarrassing than I had in the previous slides. But, you know, it's at least a lot better than it was in May. In fact, a lot better than it was a couple days ago. Now, if you attended Chandler's talk, he said something about the difference between efficiency and performance. And uh, this is all wonderful and all that, great scalability, but you know something? A properly, do ha properly tuned hash table goes about four times faster. So unless you need something specific to the tree, like range operations or the fact that the, the tree focuses its locality, locality, as in you have a CPU assigned a range, you get some locality of synchronization. Unless you need something like that, um, yeah, a hash table might be more what you want instead of this thing. But, you know, depends on what you're doing. <sighs> Providing perfect performance scalability is like committing the perfect crime. There are 50 things that might go wrong, and if you're a genius, you might be able to foresee and forestall 25 of them. <laughs> Apologies to any Kathleen Turner fans who might still be alive. <laughs> so this is just a list of the issues I've come a lot for. Um, I'm not going to go through them in detail, except to note that there's a lot less than 50 of them there, so I might have some things left to do on this. The good news is that uh, uh, you can go through and, and look at what's happening on the running system, and there's no sign of contention among the move operations. When I look at it, it's having problems with memory allocator and with the fact that the RCU implementation doesn't, isn't designed to handle huge piles of stuff coming at it at all times you know, from all places. So um, there is hope that I can scale at least quite a bit farther without uh, hitting an algorithmic limit in the algorithm as opposed to in the infrastructure. We'll see. Who knows? Advantages, disadvantages. Um, again, as I said before, this requires focused developer effort. This is not a, a kind of a, you know, close your eyes and drive without hitting something kind of an algorithm. You're going to have to pay attention, and it's going to take some investment. Uh, specialized link structures for the moment. It relies on the fact you've got pointers and deals with them that way. Uh, requires explicit memory management. Maybe we'll get shared pointer in there somehow at some time. Um, I don't see how to do that immediately right now, but you know, maybe it's possible. It's not something we do yet. Um, if you wanted to uh, take elements of the same key and kind of take the two different things and swap them among the tables, so move element one from one tree and one to the other tree and exchange their places, why well, you want to do that, I don't know, but if you did, you have, the structure has to be able to handle duplicate keys because you've got to insert two ones, one that exists and one doesn't, and then you have to switch them. And my current prototype doesn't do that. If you want to do that, that's how you do it. One cool thing is this permits irrevocable op operations. You want to hold that lock and do I.O., no problem. Go for it. You want a single step through the lock-based critical section, that works just like it always has. Um, we can use locking hierarchies, and uh, we don't need quite as much uh, vicious contention management. And uh, we get semi-decent, I'll call it semi-decent performance and scalability. It's not something I'm proud of yet, but it's showing some potential. Uh, we've talked about synchronization primitives to preserve, preserve locality of reference. If you range divide the trees, um, the piece of the tree you're messing with will stay in the cache of the CPU, and thus you're working with the laws of physics, not against them. And that can be a big advantage. 
Another thing is compatible with old hardware. Um, you get full performance. If you've got an old Pentium Pro lying around somewhere, or a Pentium, you know, original Pentium, or a 46 even, um, there are a few of those that were in parallel processors, believe it or not. Um, the stuff will work just fine on that, on those, that old hardware. And if you need a test case for memory allocator, and I'm looking at you, Alistair, man, this does a job on it. <laughs> Maybe you got better ones. I mean, if you're doing it full time, you probably got better ones, but this one's pretty good. When might you use this? Well, I don't know. I mean, we're just trying to get it working right now. Best guess is that, uh, again, you, you're willing to invest significant developer effort and you're doing many small updates to a large data structure. Complex updates that can't be efficiently implemented with just you know, dropping a pointer in. I mean, one thing you do is just duplicate the tree and then put a pointer to the new tree from the root, um, and that would trivialize the operation. Uh, but uh, that might not be what you want in some cases. Uh, you need compatibility with uh, hardware not supporting transactional memory. Uh, uh, yeah, there was something from Intel about degrading it to developer instead of production. And if you're not careful, you get a firmware update that clobbers it. Yeah, uh, they'll fix it. You know, I, I, I have confidence in them. I mean, my employer might not like my saying that, but, you know, uh, they've had a record in the past of fixing things, so I'm sure they'll fix this. Um, and if you need to be able to do a irrevocable operation as part of your data structure. But, you know, if investing significant developer effort is not your cup of tea, um, Michael Wong will be talking Friday about some alternative approaches to this problem. Okay, this is not production ready. I mean, if you want to try it, good, you know, that'd be cool. Um, this is where it was last May, kind of between limping and benchmark special. And I'd say it's kind of at the R&D prototype stage now, all right? All right, can't get worse than this. It's internet thing, the internet of things thing, you know. Uh, Linux right now is, has multiple billions of running instances, most of them smartphones that I know of. And if we have, uh, you know, smart thermostats, smart this, smart that, smart the other thing, we're gonna have uh, trillions of instances of, of things. Validation for that is gonna be one fun job. Good, clean fun right there. And uh, actually most of my work in the Linux kernel on RCU over the last couple of years has been validation. You know, how do I? How do I make this, if I, right now, with about a billion, say we have a billion instances. If I have a bug in RCU that fails once every million years of runtime, that thing's happening three times a day across the installed base. So, uh, it's, a, it's a brave new world. <laughs> there are some things kind of sort of like what I described. Here's a list of them. I'm not going to go through them in detail. And, uh, yeah, there's no silver bullet. We got some ways of handling updates. Um, in Linux kernel, we've gotten good progress by combining different techniques rather than saying we're gonna do everything this particular way of you know, what works for this sort of a thing. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration and innovation across this problem space. And some of them got mentioned in this talk. Um, this is just if you wanna look more deeply at any number of things. I'm not gonna read this word by word for some reason. I'd be legal if sponsors this slide. If you remember only one thing from this talk, let it be this. Use the right tool for the job. If some of the stuff I presented is useful to you, great, use it. Let me know how it goes and wonderful. If, so, if it's the place where that doesn't work well, I mean, if you're a hobbyist or researcher and just want to try it and see what happens, that's fine, go do that. But if you're just trying to get the job done, use something else, all right, if, it, if that's what you need. Use what you need to get your job done, whether it's something that I like or not. <laughs> With that, thank you very much for your time and attention. Sorry for going over so long and it could be fun.